Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I'm so glad you have come along. We have one of my favorite guests who I've had in the past. I'm so glad he's coming back and I'll introduce him in just a second. But this podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And this is an exciting moment in the life of WBS as we've just added a global Methodist church pastors course of study. We have almost 600 students with us this fall. It's a 600% increase in the last five years. And we have several other programs happening that we'd love for you to think about. So you can find out more about us at wbs.edu. Also, I'm thankful to my friend, Bill Roberts, who helped sponsor this podcast. He's a financial planner who comes at that discipline through his own discipleship, as he particularly is good at guiding pastors to think about retirement. It's not something they train us in in seminary. So I'd encourage you to check out williamhroberts.com, or you can find a link to that in my show notes. Finally, there are several things happening from More to Story Ministries. We have a free tool available for people who sign up for my email list. It's called Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching. And you'll learn some of the things that I learned from our guest today as we want to learn how to go deeper into the text with the aim of proclaiming that word faithfully and creatively. So it's a 45-minute teaching and a tool that you can use in your own preparation. Also, you'll find on my website at andymillerthethird.com, there are two courses available. One is a study of the book of Jude, and another is a study of the afterlife. These are um, various video sessions that have discussion guides that you can use with a Sunday school group or a small or a small group or various other groups that you might want to go deeper in studying scripture. So I'd ask you to check that out if you're interested. But now I am so glad to welcome into the podcast Dr. Ben Witherington, who serves as the Amos Chair for New Testament Studies and Doctoral Studies at Asbury Theological Seminary. Ben, welcome to the podcast. It's good to be with you, Andy. Well, you were you came on my former podcast called Captain's Corner, so people can go back in my archives and check that out. But um, it's a real delight to be able to see a new book coming out from you, which if I had you on every time you had a new book, you'd be on every other week, it feels like. <laughs> not not true, but a nice exaggeration. There you go. Well, it, it, and as we get into this, you have a new book that's coming out, or maybe it's just come out from it's Baylor out. University Press. Is it out now? Officially? Oh, it's out. Mm -hmm. Okay called Sol Sola Scriptura, Scripture's Final Authority in the Modern World. And before we get into the content of this book, I think it's interesting how this comes along at this stage in your career after, and maybe people don't know this about you, you've already written a commentary on every book of the New Testament, dozens of other books on top of that on New Testament themes, on theology in general, even uh, a novel about First Corinthians or the Corinthians, I mean, all kinds of things you've done. But it's interesting that this comes at this stage in your career. Could you help us understand why this book and why now? Well, I I had already published a book called The Living Word of God with Baylor. And, uh, you know, I, that was intended to give people a general orientation about the real nature of of the Bible and, and the Bible as the Word of God, the Bible as inspired. Um, where did it come from? The canonization of the Bible, all those kinds of usual questions. And that's now more than a decade ago when that book came out. This book is not that. Um, this book is intended to help us process some things that we may have taken for granted in the church, but you can't take for granted anymore. One of which is the final authority of Scripture in matters that the Bible actually teaches about. And my assessment of what the Bible teaches, the subjects the Bible teaches us about, are theology, ethics, salvation history, not just any old kind of history, but salvation history, um, spiritual formation. So those are the big four. And uh, here's the thing. Biblical literacy, even in the church, has diminished in my lifetime enormously. Enormously. I mean, we even have students, master level students, who come to seminary and can't even name the books of the Bible. You know, I mean, that's yeah. It's like a blank slate, you know. Oh, oh, well, we know some of our favorite scriptures, but we don't know doodly squat about most things about the Bible. 
And yeah. so um, my concern is with the decline of literacy, biblical literacy in the church, as well as the general culture, and, and the decline in things that promote discipleship, like Sunday school. I mean, the Sunday school movement is wasting away mm. in old Margaritaville. You know, <laughs> I mean, it is it is disappearing before our very eyes. What is replacing it is more worship services, including praise worship services, but not in-depth study of the Bible or in-depth Sunday school or other sort of ways to do discipleship. So, and not surprisingly, what's happened as a result since nature abhors a vacuum is that the larger agendas of the culture mm -hmm. have seeped into the church and actually taken over some of the agendas and the ways that we read the Bible, especially in regard to the presenting issue of human sexuality and sexual behavior. And so uh, my concern with this book was sort of twofold. Number one, to make clear that the long history of the Bible from biblical times until now, the majority opinion by, by a lot in any form of Christianity, whether we're talking about Roman Catholicism, Orthodoxy, Protestantism, is that the Bible is or should be the final authority in matters of faith and practice. So that's a big point right, right there. Uh, experience shouldn't be the final authority. Reason shouldn't be the final authority. A tradition shouldn't be the final authority. All of those things can be contributory to our understanding of Scripture or ways that Scripture can be expressed, but they are not an inspired final authority like the scriptures are. Mm -hmm. Certainly not. And especially in regard to making experience uh, a final authority, this is extremely dangerous because experiences can be genuine and at the same time not be true to the character of God or the character Christians should have. And so that that's a big concern I had in writing this. And Can we stop there and come to the second issue, the second matter, and I want to get there in just a minute. You mentioned the it being the final authority. A lot of people struggle even with the phrase sola scriptura, right? right. Because they they might think, and I've heard, I heard Kevin Van Hooser say this for the first time I ever heard anybody articulate this. Sola scriptura is not solo scriptura, right? right. And what, you're being very clear in this book to not you to, 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 to differentiate what you're saying by saying final authority. What is that not saying? Well, the the phrase sola scriptura, of course, literally as a translation of the Latin means only scripture. And, and that actually is with very conservative Protestants and, and some others, uh, what they mean by the phrase. But if you actually are a student of church history, that's like never what it's right. meant, because tradition had some uh, some authority, uh, experience had some kind of authority, uh, reason had some kind, right reason had some kind of authority, uh, not on a par with scripture, and not as some kind of quadrilateral where they were an equilateral and they all have the same authority, or one could trump the other. You know, um, when I say what sola scriptura really has meant over the many ages of and more than 2000 years now, it is that it is the final litmus test, the final authority mm -hmm. on matters it actually teaches about. Right. Right. And, and of course, the negative side of that is there are a whole host of things it doesn't teach us about, like how to brush our teeth, what clothes to wear what car to buy, et cetera, et cetera. The age of the earth doesn't teach us that. It's not a scientific textbook, those kinds of things. So knowing exactly what the Bible is trying to teach us is one thing. And, and then knowing that the Bible touches a lot of things that it's not trying to teach us about. I mean, it's not trying to teach us the, the, the history of the Hittites or the Hivites or the Amorites or the Termites. It's not trying to teach us <laughs> Right. 
It's not trying to teach us any of that. Those things only come into the picture tangentially insofar as uh, they have contact with God's people. That's it. Mm -hmm. End of story. So knowing what it teaches and not merely what it touches is, is critical to understanding the authority of the Bible and what subjects it is the final authority for. So that's one thing that I yeah. was trying to accomplish with this. But but the other thing I was trying to accomplish is to ask the question, how have we gotten to our current malaise? Mm -hmm. So I had to review in this book uh, the process from the Reformation to the Enlightenment to the modern rise of science, the rise of evolution, all those sorts of things. And then the reaction by conservative Christians to that with uh, the Chicago Statement of Iner Inerrancy and various other things like that, okay? Because it, you can't really know where this is all going if you don't know where you are in the history of the process of all of this, especially in the West. So, you know, I'm, those were the twofold aims that, that I was striving for. But the other subtle aim, which is addressed, is that people sometimes would take a parade issue like slavery and say, yeah. well, since we cannot <laughs> affirm what the Bible says about slavery, since the Bible is wrong right, about right. slavery, then here are some other issues it's wrong on, including human sexuality, okay? Right. Uh, and so what I decided I needed to do in the appendix to the book was uh, deconstruct that whole argument based on slavery. The Bible does not, in fact, endorse slavery. It deals with the reality of slavery that was in the ancient Near East and in the Greco-Roman world, but it deals with it in ways that deconstruct various aspects of it. And, and that's what I wanted to say. And of course, the proof of that for me was, I mean, I work at the Museum of the Bible from time to time, hmm. and there was an exhibit for several months of the Slave Bible. Now, what's mm -hmm. that? This is a Bible that was produced in Britain for their colonies, as well as for the United Kingdom as well, which cut out 25% of the Bible hmm. that those who were producing this Bible thought endorsed anti-slavery hmm, now that should tell us that should tell us everything right if the bible is so pro-slavery why do you have to drop a quarter of the bible you know edit out a quarter of the bible that has anything to do with slavery yeah uh, so you know i'm i'm trying to make clear that the bible has plenty to say about slavery but what it doesn't say is that god endorses slavery and therefore we should too it doesn't say that and uh, so I'm trying to deal with the usual objections to, well, the Bible teaches us this form of sexual behavior is immoral, but we don't have to pay attention to that because we're modern people and we know better. So yeah. I'm trying to deal with those kinds of issues. It's like uh, E. Stanley Jones has a kind of clever way of saying he's, he said it was like a stick of dynamite that various authors put in to scripture like uh Philemon, you know, like we have Paul's words to Philemon. It was like a stick of dynamite that would explode centuries later. Um, and I, I, lo I love that image. I'm interested in the fact that this is this book comes from you now. And it's something that could you have written this? I mean, you could have in a sense hmm. at the beginning of your career. I mean, it comes at the after you've written all of these commentaries, and these other pieces. Is Is there a significance to the order in that? I could have written it earlier for sure, but, uh, you know, what the crisis that produced this book mm. is what's happened. I'm a cradle Methodist. I mean, my mom said my first two words were John Wesley. I kind of doubt <laughs> that, you know, but I, I've been in the Methodist church, in particular, the United Methodist Church, all my all life. I'm ordained in that church, right? Yeah. So the presenting issue for me was, it was high time I did something that's mm. of relevance to deal with that presenting issue from the point of view as what of what is the final authority of the Bible about these kinds of issues. So yes, I could have done it sooner, but in fact, now is would be the propitious moment to do it. 
uh, as a new Methodist denomination is launching and an old one is uh, disaffiliating seven, eight, nine thousand churches, you know, uh, now would be the time to give some guidance about this for the future. And I'm really hoping that this book for Nazarenes and Wesleyans and free Methodists and inexpensive Methodists and the GMC <laughs> and whoever else are out there. Salvation that, Army, throw it in there. Hmm? Salvation Army, too. Oh, absolutely. The Salvation Army. Pentecostal churches that are not Calvinist. Oh, you know, my hope would be that this book will will light a fire under those folks to continue to hold to a very high view of Scripture in all the things it intends to teach us. That would be my hope. I love that. And I think in this moment of what's happening with Methodism, I, I've talked about that a fair amount on this program, but you have a gift of, of wit and uh, conciseness at times. And sometimes it's just really helpful when I hear you tell the story that I've been trying to read about for a long time. So what, could you tell my audience just a nice little summary of what's going on in Methodism? Well, what's happening in Methodism with the decline of biblical literacy hmm. is a reinterpretation of texts that for 2,000 years have been read a particular way, which are now deliberately being read a different way uh, in order to justify a change in stance on things like gay marriage and transgender things and various other parts of the whole discussion of human sexuality, okay? And so um, because that's going on, uh, even for those who are not leaving the United Methodist Church or some other mainline denomination, which has changed its stance on these issues, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and though the United Methodist Church has not learned any lessons from what happened to the Episcopal Church or the Presbyterian USA Church or the Lutheran Church when they went this way, and lost thousands of members that they didn't learn anything from all of those previous experiences. No, they decided to go down the same road. And uh, so that's, you know, that's really why I, I have been doing this for me. It's, it's a heart issue because mm -hmm. my heart is just broken yeah. with my cradle denomination in regard to what's happening and, and the cause of what's happening. And it is a very peculiar situation. The people who are leaving are the people who are still faithful to the United Methodist discipline. Right. That's just weird. You know, you, you, that doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. But the thing is, they can see the handwriting on the wall of where this is going. And, um, you know, the other part of it that gives me agida, as our Italian friends would say, is that, you know, I'm a John Wesley Fellow. Mm -hmm. I was picked in 1977 to be a John Wesley Fellow. And the goal of now 180 John Wesley Fellows out there was to reform our seminaries in a way that was more uh, congenial to orthodoxy in various ways. You know, that was the goal. Right. And many John Wesley Fellows, including me, who have actually taught at some United Methodist seminaries along the way, but frankly, the, the progressive tide that uh, washed over the culture has washed over these seminaries as well, and uh, almost without exception. And, and now, you know, what's happened is that particular effort by John Wesley Fellows, it has not accomplished what Ed Robb originally hoped it would accomplish. Indeed, some of the John Wesley fellows have gone over to the dark side of the force on these issues. Yeah. And, and so me, that's, that's the second heartbreak. I love these people. I've mentored a lot of these people. And uh, unfortunately, on these key issues, they have decided to punt or, you know, say nothing, or in fact, endorse positions that are certainly not biblical in any way. And so, you know, for me, um, it's one of those, here I stand, I can do no other. I had to say something. And and this is as, you know, ironic a way as I could do it by writing a book that's not polemical, but deals with the facts. 
And so you do that by like leaning on some of the principles that you've you know taught students and people who've heard you preach or teach for a while, even just the basic idea that the text means what it meant, right? This is like kind of like a key, a key kind of foundational piece. But it's of course that doesn't mean that it's done in isolation. Anybody who looks at any of the work that you've done, or I would hope that people who've come, you know, from you, students of yours through the years, would then do the same thing that we are looking at the tradition, but we are looking to the final authority of scripture as the, the kind of the norming norm behind what we're able to establish. So, so can you help me understand, like, uh, is that too simplistic that it means what it meant? I mean, it seems like a pretty clear principle. Well, there's two parts to that. The first part is, yes, what the text, text meant when the inspired writers wrote them mm -hmm. is still what it means today. Now, it may have a new significance for us in a different cultural setting and may have a different application, but the meaning has not changed, nor do we have the right to treat the Bible like a Rorschach test into which we could read that in that ink blot, whatever we wanted to read in it mm. or out of it. Uh, and you know, the, the other artful dodge is to say, well, there are many interpretations of this. Right. Okay. What that really means is my interpretation today is at odds with uh, 99% of all previous interpretations of these texts, but I'm right. And I see, see, what that means is that the real final authority is the person who's doing the interpreting. There it not, is. Not scripture itself. Okay? Mm -hmm. so that's, that's the big deal. So besides saying it meant what it means, the other thing I say is a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to be. Yes. And, and and so the other thing that's happened is taking these texts out of context and and then just skewing them in a direction that's favorable to your own gestalt and trajectory. Well, and you very kindly put me in my place in seminary. You know, that's a very important job. And I, you know, six generations in the Salvation Army, and you did this with love and respect, but it's really helpful to see like the way that the Salvation Army did this and has done this in our own interpretation with reference to the historic Protestant sacraments, right? And you very kindly said to me, well, it's just you and the Quakers. I'm not challenging your salvation, but you're going against all of these other interpretations. And that's an important place to keep in mind. Like I wanted to maintain a certain standard just because it was fitting in with, here it is, my experience, right? And I had a good experience in yeah. that tradition, but sure. it can't hold up. Yeah, well, exactly. And and frankly, that's where the body of Christ comes in. All of us have deficiencies and blind spots. I mean, amen to that, right? Yeah. So we need the whole body of Christ as a corrective to our particular lacunae or gaps in our understanding, in our experience, in our faith practice. We, we need that. I mean, I have friends that are Orthodox Christians. I have friends that are Catholic Christians. I have all Boku, hundreds of domination Protestant friends from all over the world, and I've taught all over the world. And, the, you know, and my bottom line is we need them all. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'll give you one example. Father Jim Martin is a, is a Jesuit in New York City. He's a, he's a good friend of mine, and he's just written a book on Lazarus as the beloved disciple. One of my uh, favorite topics. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite topics. And, you know, we're good friends. There are many ways that we differ uh, yeah. along the way, but he's a genuine, devout Christian who loves the Bible, right? And so what John Wesley said in his famous letter to Catholics in Ireland was, if your hand yeah, you know, if your heart is with my heart on these issues, give me mm. your hand. Let's work together. That's the ironic and ecumenical way that I think we need to be viewing each other today. In the church, we can learn from each other. There's lots to be learned from each other. And I really enjoy that kind of cross-fertilization. I think it's a good thing. Yeah, I, I not surprised. I, you've gotten me in trouble because I've adopted that Lazarus view. Occasionally, people look at me with a 
Interesting. But I can't I can't walk away from it. I never saw the beloved disciple the same way after you unfolded that that teaching there. So another subject, I guess. Oh, OK, go ahead. You want to I, I can about say that? one more thing about yeah. that. Just one last thing. Jim Martin is with the Pope right now. He's been with the Pope for a month and a half because they're having a conclave on a whole issue, a whole panoply of major issues that are eating them alive, including the whole rule about celibacy, which mm -hmm. has caused in, innumerable uh, problems, not the least of which is they don't have enough priests mm -hmm. you know, anymore. Celibacy is not a fav, fav rave in the world. <laughs> it just isn't. So th the thing is that he is sharing a lot of the exegetical work he's done with the Pope to help the Pope have a more biblical view of a lot of these issues. And I'm going, you go, Jim, you go. <laughs> this is a good thing. I like Pope Francis. I've met Pope Francis, but uh, a, an exegete, he's not. And nice. so, you know, Jim, Jim is trying to inject the Bible into the conversation, and that's a good thing. Now, I might have the uh, my various people within the Catholic, Roman Catholic world off in my mind, but it, it, wouldn't Jim Martin be somebody who wouldn't affirm the church's historical stance on sexuality? I mean, he's kind well, of. Well, it, he affirms the doctrine and the dogma of the Catholic Church. Okay. What he does not affirm is the way the church has treated gay and lesbian people. And he's tried to correct that. He, he believes that that we should love everybody, even if we don't love their ways, even mm. if we don't endorse some of their behaviors. And that would be true of everybody. Sure. That would be true of everybody. So, you know, he's had a ministry to gay and lesbian persons uh, so long as he doesn't violate the official statements of the church on these issues. So he's not running around advocating gay marriage or gay organization. Okay. He's just not, you know, he may have some opinions about that, but he is faithful to his own church and its official teachings and stays within those parameters, whatever his inclinations may be. And, and I really admire that. I mean, that's, yeah. You know, that's so different from United Methodists who say this is what the discipline says, but to heck with the discipline, you know, yeah. that's a very different attitude towards the official authority of what the church says about such things. And in, in, in United Methodism, uh, the challenge, as you've already alluded to, the so-called quadrilateral. I mean, you think that that's in part a, um, is, is the quadrilateral, particularly how it has been interpreted. Does it stand at odds with Sola Scriptura? Well. It has been read that way. Now, the person who came up with the term, who profoundly regretted it later, is yes. Albert Outler, the great uh, theologian and church historian from Perkins, and Wesley scholar as yeah. well. And he he later said to me and to others, I wish I had never opened my mouth and mentioned that term, because it was like opening Pandora's box. Because that then gave permission to various people to say, well, experience is just as important in the authority as this or that or the other. Now, one of the chapters in my book, Sola Scriptura, makes very clear that John Wesley didn't think experience was an authority. Hmm. They, he believed that the truth of Scripture could be confirmed in experience. That's a whole different ballgame. Right, right. That's a whole different ball game. Uh, he believed that reason could help us to improperly in, uh, interpret scripture. He believed tradition could help us properly interpret scripture. But at no point was there any of those things a final authority on things that scripture teaches us. And so it's a total misuse of the Wesleyan tradition and of John Wesley to say that he had a view of scripture that uh, fit the modern discussion on the quadrilateral. This is not true. John mm -hmm. Wesley famously said, if there be one error in the scriptures, oh, there yeah. may as well be a thousand. But as for me, there are nada. <laughs> Anything that the scripture is teaching us is true and trustworthy. I just had uh, Calvin Robinson come on the podcast. He is an Anglican 
leader in um in England after he was a part of the Church of England but was never able to be fully ordained there because he stood up for issues of on human sexuality with a biblical view and at an Oxford Union debate he said something to this effect like he said well you might say that we have a fuller understanding now of human sexuality and and maybe we do maybe we maybe we know more than past generations knew he said this but but do we know more than God like, do we know more than what God has revealed through his word? And this idea, too, that what you're saying is connected to what John Wesley said about the nature of the of the truthfulness of Scripture. And you and I are both at institutions that say something somewhat dramatic. And some people might look at us as fundamentalists because we say that the Bible is without error in all that it affirms. I and mean, what's behind that? Like when we're trying to say... And you mentioned the Chicago statement on inerrancy, but that's a, a kind of a broader way of just talking about, I think, the truthfulness of Scripture. Yeah, exactly. It's truthful and trustworthy in the things that it teaches us or the things that it affirms. And that, that's exactly right. Now, I mean, one of the things that's, of course, remarkable about Scripture is the honesty of Scripture. Hmm. When David tells a lie... We get a report of a lie, and Nathan confronts him on it, right? Uh, so we have true reports of lies. We have true reports of mistakes. Yes. True reports of errors. And not only that, in the Psalms, and here Martin Luther is a big help. He says, the Psalms reveal what's on the heart of the psalmist truly, accurately. Yeah. So. When the psalmist says, blessed are those who dash the uh, heads of the Edomite babies on the rocks, he's not reflecting God's view on this. Mm. He's truly and accurately representing his own desires. Mm -hmm. It's the true revelation of the human heart. And I think that's true in the Psalms over and over again. You know, so when, when you begin to ask the question, what is the subject matter of the Bible? It's not just revealing to us what's on God's heart, what's God will, God's will, et cetera. It's also holding up a mirror to ourselves, mm -hmm. saying, this is how you as a fallen person are. Deal with it. Here's mm. an honest reflection about that. Okay. Mm. And, and that's powerful. So there are a lot of things in the Bible that don't reveal God's will. God's will was never that we sin. God's will was never that there be evil in the world. God is not the author of evil. Amen. Thank you very much, John Calvin. Not the <laughs> author of evil, right? So uh, we need to be ha having a nuanced way that we use, interpret, apply the Bible, because the Bible is a complex, diverse book. And mm -hmm. not everything it touches is something that it teaches us about. Hmm. That is a helpful clarification. And I think that's the, the nuance that's needed to say that like sola scriptura is not, as I've heard another person say, it's not scriptura nuda or the, the naked text all by itself. Like this, no. this is a, we're, we're looking at literary conventions. I mean, this is what you did throughout your, your commentaries. Like we're looking in a deeper way behind what the scriptures are trying to do. Yeah, Exactly. Uh, so we're supposed to be interpreting metaphor as metaphor, visionary descriptions as visionary descriptions. You know, it's not all flatly literal. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I have a perfect ex illustration of that. I mean, it was just after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And a friend and I took my dad's 55 Chevy up to the Blue Ridge Parkway in the mountains of North Carolina and went for a ride. And we were riding along having a big, big old time. And all of a sudden the clutch blew out. And as the scriptures say, my countenance fell because <laughs> there are no gas stations or repair shops on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Right. So yeah. we had to be pushed down a ramp into a Texaco station and the man had no tools and no parts to fix the car. Wow. So we had to hitchhike home all the way back to the middle of the States in High Point. So we stuck out our thumb and we got picked up by two really elderly people in an old Plymouth. And they happened to be going in the right direction towards North Wilkesboro and on towards High Point. 
So he took the ride. Now, my friend, Doug Harris, who was with me, who uh, in his adult life has been a lawyer and very loquacious, asked the driver of the car, not before we got more than a mile down the road, well, what'd you think about Neil Armstrong walking on the moon and all those pictures of the earth revolving and blue and beautiful in the sky? Yeah. And the driver said, that's all fake. <laughs> Hollywood stunt never happened. And Doug, not recognizing invincible ignorance when he saw it, said, well, why in the world do you think that? And the man replied, it says in the book of Revelations. I mean, beware of anybody that starts a sentence like that, because that's not even the name of that book. Right? right. As in the book of Revelations, the angels will stand on the four corners of the earth. Can't be round, can it, mister, if it's got four corners? Wow. That's what you call a literal interpretation of a metaphorical text, a huge mistake, right. a huge mistake. The author is not trying to teach us the shape of the earth. He's saying that the angels will gather God's people from all corners on the earth. That's all he's saying, right? Mm -hmm. But this poor man thought that he had to interpret every single last iota of the Bible in, in terms of his own sense of what counts as literal. Mm. Well, that's not good interpretation of scripture because that's actually violating what the author was intending to say and do with that text. It's interesting. Some people try to bring, I would say, like people like you and me and this tradition um, and coalesce us into this that same very pie, kind man who gave you a ride. Right. To say, well, then anybody who takes this view of sola scriptura is in that camp. And so much so, like I've, he I've heard some people even lately, some other scholars suggest that, well, the problem with that type of view, sola scriptura, is that it's overly emphasizing epistemology as opposed to the fact that scripture is about soteriology. Now, I'm I'm cautious of somebody trying to split those pieces up. I'm not suggesting that the Bible is 100 percent accurate in trying to describe the four corners of the universe of the, of the planet. Uh, I'm not saying that, but instead there is historical data. Like this is, uh, it's spoken in space and time in a real reality. So I don't see why it can't be both. Yeah. Well, again, I would say the Bible's, for example, the Bible's not only not teaching us cosmology, it's not teaching us anthropology. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The heart, as we know today, is just a pump. There are not any thoughts in here. The thoughts are in here, right? Yeah. The Bible's not teaching us anthropology. So the question is, what are the subjects the Bible's actually teaching us? Mm -hmm. Theology, ethics, spiritual formation, salvation history. That's what it's teaching us. And if you stick with those, you will not go wrong. You will not go wrong. So, you know, I think that's part of the problem, really, is people uh, want this broad span of things that it's teaching us, right? It's not teaching us anthropology. It's not teaching us the age of the earth. It's not, it's not a pseudo-scientific textbook downloaded on a pre-scientific era who couldn't, po couldn't possibly have understood that stuff anyway right so no god's revelation was appropriate to the age in which it was revealed and it was revealed in such a way that people could understand it then and now see this is another problem we've got people today that say well bless their hearts those people to whom the prophecies were written originally including the prophecies in the book of revelation well they couldn't possibly understand them because really those things were are being fulfilled now 2,000 years later, and you need to have lived 2,000 years later to understand that that stuff about flying bugs is really about Black Hawk helicopters and on and on and on, right? This is utter nonsense. It was a revelation to God's people 2,000 and 2,000 plus years ago, and it had a meaning for them in the first place. What kind of arrogance reads the Bible and assumes anachronistically that it's only for us now? Mm -hmm. And we're the ones, bless our hearts, who understand it 
But those poor slobs couldn't possibly have understood it back then, back there. Mm-hmm. That is the height of arrogance and just wrong. Yeah. This is really interesting uh, to think about like these little details. And again, anybody who wants to look at this perspective as if it is just overly narrow, I mean, just we could talk about this for hours. I'm interested the fact that you studied this for so long and just your life has in your career and your teaching is just focused on scripture. Um, you decide to go through and look at this historical presentation. You go, you know, from the early church fathers to the reformation, the rise of modern science, you know, the modern period. Was there something new to you that you found? I mean, I, I'll admit, like when I see you, when I think about you, I think about, I just feel like you could just speak the books out. Like you have, have it all there, but I imagine there was something that, um, might have surprised you that you learned in the oh, research. Absolutely. I mean, I had the usual Protestant bias assumption that this whole waving the sola scriptura banner was a Protestant thing. Hmm. And then I discovered that the people who first coined the phrase and used the phrase and believed the phrase were Mar- Marsilius of Padua, a priest, okay. uh, and uh, William of Ockham, a philosopher in England. And John Wycliffe, whom we know as a translator, but also a Catholic priest. These are all Catholics. And they use the phrase to say, no, the Pope is not the final authority. Wow. What they meant by it was scripture has the final say, not the Pope, not the church councils, not the conclave. Uh, you know, not the gathering of cardinals to make decisions. No, the final authority is scripture itself. Mm. And the one who's most clear about this is is Wycliffe. But as it turns out, there were more. There were more. So when Martin Luther comes along and says, sola fide, sola gratia, sola scriptura, I mean, he's echoing things that have been said before by other Roman Catholics, because, of course, Luther began as an Augustinian Catholic monk. Mm. You know? I mean, and he learned some of these things from the history that he knew. So for me, it was new to know the first persons that were waving the Sola Scriptura banner were not Protestants. They they, they were Catholic folk. And, and uh, you know, so for me, that was refreshing. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I look forward. So again, folks, I'm talking to Dr. Ben Witherington, who's written a new book that's come out from Baylor University Press called Sola Scriptura. They describe it. I don't know, uh, in the the promotional materials, they say, with this magisterial study, how do you like being described as having a magisterial study? I'm guessing you didn't write that about yourself. No, I I certainly didn't. Uh, You know, that's that's what the British would call over-egging the pudding. (laughs) Uh, that's probably too big a claim. That's for somebody else to assess. It's not for me to assess any way of what the real importance of this is. But I certainly felt some urgency in doing this. I wrote this last January, February, March, you know, mm-hmm. and gradually added more to it and more to it. And then Baylor jumped on on board and said, oh, we definitely want this. Wait, please, please send it. Don't send it to anybody else. Please send it to us. Mm. And, uh, so, you know, I, I had a happy publisher that was eager for it. And that's always a good situation instead of it's like pulling teeth. Could we please publish this? Well, I don't know. Right. Maybe come back to me later about this. I'll give it some thought and prayer, you know, those kinds of things. And that was not the case with this. For them, they saw this as important. And, uh, you know, if you look at the blurbs on the back, uh, they got some people, Protestant and Catholic, to say, yeah, this is really important considering where we are in the culture at this point. So, you know, And I don't mean to be too tribalistic with this statement, but it, but we don't have many works like that. We have your earlier work with Baylor, The Living Word, but there's not many... Uh, a Wesleyan voices that are describing this uh, basic understanding of like what we mean as scripture being divine revelation. And so I think there's like a definitely like a Wesleyan contribution here, but I know that you don't want to probably just, and, and this is brought on by your own experiences in with United Methodism, but this isn't just a Wesleyan Methodist type of piece. And you see that very clearly by the people who've endorsed this. No, that's exactly right. And, and it, it's pan-Protestantism as well. 
you know, many of my Calvinist friends were going to be mostly happy with this. Many of them don't even know what John Wesley's views were on these subjects. That's why I spent a whole chapter saying, mostly let's talk about John Wesley because he's been underestimated or wrongly represented by his own descendants mm -hmm. in the Methodist tradition. And so let's let's really look at what he says about scripture. So I I laid that out in lavender. I mean, it's in detail. There it is. This is what he actually says about scripture. And, uh, you know, I, a lot of my Calvinist friends will say, well, well, golly, how come Methodists didn't agree with John Wesley? You know, and there you go. That's a fair point. That's, yeah, it's a very fair point. You know, the early Methodists certainly did. Francis Asbury certainly did. Richard Watson, the great early Methodist theologian of the 19th century, absolutely did. And so, uh, and, and Clark, and, you know, yeah. yeah, well, absolutely. But the thing that interests me is that in American Methodism, if you look at the first half of the 19th century, the required textbooks were Wesley's notes on the New Testament, Wesley's standard sermons, and Watson's Institutes. Mm. Those were the required readings for Methodist preachers in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, we would do well to require them all over again. There you go. Because they were congenial to and conversant with the scriptures and, uh, and, and powerfully so in various ways. We've talked a little bit here about your your career and where this comes and like what's brought this about. But I just love for for people to hear some of the things you're doing now. Before we got on the call, you're talking about you're thinking this was going to be like kind of like a, a a phasing down, so to speak. You're not teaching as much and maybe the this ways you did 20 years ago, but mainly focusing on doctoral students. But there's a, been a resurgence. Tell us a little about what you know how God's using you in your teaching ministry now. Well, you know when the pandemic happened, all of a sudden like mushrooms all over the forest, podcasts started springing up, <laughs> you know, uh, among other things, among other things. And um, so these were ways to do ministry, even when you were isolated from other people and couldn't have physical contact with them. These were ways to, you know, suddenly Zoom zoomed up the chart as a valuable resource. That's uh, right. the, we, these were ways we could continue to teach our students even when we couldn't be with them in person. And so, you know, uh, we're in a new stage of education, as you know perfectly well. Some institutions have gone to entirely online education. Mm -hmm. And I, honestly, I, I don't feel good about that in terms of ministry because it is the job of seminary professors and counselors and, and teachers to evaluate the spiritual formation of their students mm -hmm. and say, yes, this person's ready for ministry. You really can't do that in a purely online setting. You can't, you know, and, uh, and you know, what, what happened in my tradition, at least, is there was this ping pong ball that went back and forth between the Board of Ordained Ministry and the seminaries. You know, seminary, some seminaries would say, well, that's for the Board of Ordained Ministry to decide whether they're spiritually ready. For ministry or not and the board of ordained ministry would say we have them for like two hours once every two years you're seeing them all the time no seminaries are supposed to evaluate this right yeah. and so i i have some very serious reservations about theological education done purely online i, I think that's a less than the best we can do which is one of the reasons why asbury has this not only uh, insistence on please come to campus, but we have hybrid models where we go to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm fulfilling my destiny as a Methodist circuit writer. I'm there you go. Going to Tulsa in February because of our hybrid with a church in Tulsa. You know, um, and and they're coming to us for hybrids as well. Well, it's it's a compromise, but it's better than nothing but online education and and I, I really have problems with with that i think i'm i'm not just old-fashioned i believe that face to face and getting to know your students personally is crucial to the future of the church because we don't want to unleash people on the church that have talents and gifts but are not 
transformed by the fruit mm-hmm. of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. You know, we need to be able to give character witness to these people, to the denominations. And you're also doing a fair amount of work, too, with uh, doctoral students, right? That's a, a big emphasis that you've had is like training up a new generation of scholars like WBS's own, Murray Vassar and others like him. Um, they, I mean, that's has that been a shift for you to do more doctoral uh, ministry? Well, we got this going about 13 or so years ago through the generosity of two wonderful Methodists, the Amos family in Columbus, Georgia. And it's taken us a while to get up to speed and to know exactly what we needed to do and to have the full staff to be able to do it. You know, and uh, in fact, I mean, all the way back to 95, this was part of the vision of Maxie Dunham. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. I I remember the phone call that he made to me while I was busy teaching at Ashland Seminary. Ben, this is Maxie. This Mm -hmm. is Maxie. You need to get your hindquarters down here to Wilmore. We're going to start a doctoral program. We're hiring 11 or 13 new people. Hurry up. (laughs) <laughs> we to get this doctoral program going, you know, <laughs> and I went, wow, okay, that's an interesting invitation. Is is Asbury really going to be able to get up to speed to have a top quality doctoral program that's academically rigorous, but also uh, spiritually and theologically right where it ought to be? Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. Well, it took a while to get there, to be honest. There were a lot of things that we had to adjust along the way. We had to keep reviving the stu- revising the student handbook and whatnot. But at this point, we're getting students that are top quality students from all over the world. The program is half domestic and half foreign. Hmm. And, and so we're training Methodists from all over the world, as well as non-Methodists from all over the world. And uh, who could have envisioned that we'd have 100 PhD students you know, after a decade in this program, but we have. And so, you know, uh, it's it's something that in the providence of God, the time was ripe for this. And for someone like me, who's, you know, heading towards the finish line, but not there yet, Amen. Yeah. this came at the right time in my career, for sure, mm-hmm. because I had gotten the the largest quantity of the things I needed to write done. Mm. And now I could invest in the writing of these doctoral students, amongst other things. I love that you're able to do that. I love you're able to take time and like feed into the lives of these uh, scholars who are emerging and like going to serve the church and seminaries and colleges. Um, we need it. And so I'm so thankful for that pipeline that's been established there. My podcast is called More to the Story, and I often ask people, is there more to the story than you typically tell on a podcast or things people don't know about you? You're a pretty colorful guy, I'll have to admit, sitting in a class all of a sudden, if there happened to be a piano, you turn around and play a Claire de Lune. Next thing I know, you're picking up a guitar and a harmonica. You have all kinds of things. So tell us, what's something that you don't talk about very often, something that you like to do? Uh, There's more to the story of Ben Witherington. Well... Um, you know, I grew up in a musical family. My mother was a pianist and a piano teacher. Okay. She taught at various colleges in North Carolina growing up. And so I grew up in music, you know, not just church choirs. I played in an orchestra from the time I was. What'd you play? Violin. Did you? Uh, okay. I was eight and all the way through high school. And then, then I played in the string quartet at, at Carolina and. You know, uh, but I'm also a child of the 60s. I loved the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the whole nine yards. So I I took up the guitar, you know, and I played the guitar and I I played guitar for InterVarsity and InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at Carolina, you know, with small groups and that sort of stuff and on retreats and and whatnot. And I worked in the in the rock and roll industry working for the record bar chain. Huh. From concerts, selling tickets, selling a zillion records. I mean, I still love all that stuff. I'm still a musical person, and I I love all of that stuff. Um, so if you so- had one concert, if you got you get, get I'm just going to narrow it down. You go to a classical concert. What would you want to hear? If you get to hear an orchestra, what piece would you want to be listening to? Oh well, there's a million, but um, you know, 
my, you get my, two or three. How about that? I won't leave. I won't keep going. Well, I would say I would want to go hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Yes. Or, or Brahms' First Symphony, or perhaps Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. I love all of that. Prokofiev's Classical Symphony. Um, uh, musical pieces like Mussorgsky's Pictures at an Exhibition. Yes. Yeah. It even. Even Emerson Lake and Palmer tried to do a rock and roll version of, you know, there's there's so much of that that I just it's part of my soul, my musical soul. And I I love all of that. And so that's a part of me. The other thing is that I've always, you know, I've been a runner for most mm -hmm. of my life in the when I got to be 38, I said, well, it's now or never. So I ran three marathons. I ran the Cleveland Marathon and then. Uh, in 93, I ran the Boston Marathon, and then after that, I ran my hometown marathon in Charlotte, mm -hmm. North Carolina. So I'm still, I'm a very slow jogger or power walker at this point. Gotcha. I've always, I took very seriously John Wesley's exhortation to stay in reasonable fit and eat reasonably, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I still try, I still try to do that as well. So, you know, I love sports. I love music. Those are my hobbies. Those are the things that, that, you know, keep me going and get me excited in various ways. I love it. Well, thanks so much for taking time with us here. We're so thankful for this book, which Baylor calls a magisterial study, which I'm excited to, that it's going to be out there and that people could use it as a textbook, but it certainly is available and accessible to lay people as well. So thankful for your ministry, Ben. It means a lot to me that you take time to come on my podcast and we appreciate what you're doing. Well, you are most welcome. And I will tell you that I just got finished doing with a Salvation Army event last month. Okay. I had an absolute blast with your fellow Salvationists in Nashville. We oh, had, good. Uh, you know, it was several regions gathering together in Nashville for a little retreat. We had a blast. It was just great. And one of the things I love about the Salvation Army folks is what you see is what you get. Mm. as genuine as the day is long they love the bible they love the lord and you know it's not like pulling teeth to teach them they want mm. to eat it up you know? yeah so for me this is easy this is like <laughs> spoon feeding somebody the best southern barbecue imaginable right because they, they 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 want it they desire yeah. it. so uh, greetings to you from all of those folks well, thanks so much god bless you thanks for your time